All right, so it is recording. Um, yep, okay. All right, so I did some changes to my notes. Hopefully that will make some you know, improvement to how you guys understand the concept of propositional logic. So we are returning to this concept. But this time I have you know, some additional examples that's going to help. So you still need to kind of organize things a little bit differently. So that's another time. Okay. So I gave you this example. Hopefully it will give you a bit of an idea that you can find a propositional map that is very simple. So you can have a little bit of an So that shows you how to do it. Start with, we're going to start with alpha, you know, which is you know, what we on the first line. Um, is this font size okay, or do you want me to This is okay? All right. <clears throat> so this is alpha. You know, as I said, you know, alpha contains you know, constants. So the constants in this case are zeros and ones, which means that they cannot and be on a value. It cannot store a value. It is a value by itself, but that's it. And then we have P, Q, R, S, T as our variables. So P, Q, R, S, T, each one can hold at any particular time you know, within the logic system. Um, it can have the value of one of these constants that we have here. And then we have row, we have phi, and we have row, we have phi, and then we have psi. These are the Greek letters. They are known as humatas. Humatas do not they're not variables. They are more like placeholders, so that we, we have to say we have we need those mechanisms in order to have okay, to specify patterns or to, to execute them. So then we have omega. These are the operators. So I'm simplifying this and not include um, equivalent to. So we have the usual and, we have the or, we have the implied, and then we have the use negation. The out of the four, these three belong to omega two. This one belongs to omega one. Omega two, omega one are basically just referring to a subset of omega based on the number of operands that are needed in order to consider this person omega. And those belong to omega one. So are we doing okay so far? Okay. So I am not distinguishing you know, just based on what we already know about the operators. So I'm not dividing the, the, the further into omega two. One to just kind of understand that these three are omega two, and this one single one is omega one. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so this time I have an iota, and iota basically is the sum of all the row functions that form B that are just given to you as true. Don't ask why they are just known to be true. They're axiomatic. So in this case, we have true, you know, which is kind of like Okay, you know, no surprises there. The negation of false, no surprises there either. And then for whatever strange reason, I say that S or T implies Q is also known to be true. So what is known to be true is not S or T. It is not Q. It is the implication itself. Okay. And then we also know that you know, the negation of Q is true, which means Q is false. Is that okay? So that's all we know. <clears throat> so the question is, can we deduce anything about S and T? In other words, if I were to ask, well, okay, you know, we know not Q is true, which means Q is false. We know the implication of Q is also true. Can we say anything about S in relation to not? Can we say something about T in relation to not? That's basically what we're trying to address in this particular derivation. And then the most complicated part is zeta, okay? Because zeta is a set of basically each element in zeta is a root. It is also called a transformation. So depending on which class you know, you know, or what context you know, you may refer to each element of the root as a 
tool as a transformation tool uh, for using as an input in machine. All of those are linked to describing age and enhancement in Internet. In this particular letter, we have okay, I think I did a poor job with uh, I missed a comma here, so let me go fix that. Do you guys want me to fix it or is it okay? Just to understand that I missed a comma. You want me to fix it? I can do it like really quick. Okay. So if it is the first one, I'm just gonna double check the other one. There's a comma here. Good. This one is good. So it's really just the first one that is the comma. It's not so much the yeah, it is comma here. So let me fix that. And I apologize for all the problems. Alright, so I am looking for another example. Once I find it, I just go to the first example. And we put the comma. Oh, okay, that's right. Because I put a backslash in front of it. Just got two problems. That's not good. Changes. It can take a little bit of time to update. Like maybe 25 seconds. Yep. So I apologize for the, <coughs> the potential motion sickness. So back to the example. It's not updated yet. Meanwhile, I'm just double checking that we are recording. Yep, and audio is good. Recording the right as well. Yep, there we go. Okay. So there's a comma here. So we have a few elements. This is one element. Okay, this is the one that we talked about last time. Whatever is to the left-hand side of the input interval, from, um, it specifies a set of matches. Okay, meaning that these are needed in order to match the signature on the own. really looking for any specific tasks or even you know uh, well performed leads that are known to be true okay there's no requirement whatsoever and then I can bind uh, psi to anything I want to um, and then I can mark psi or not psi to be true so for instance in this case you know I did not use an example here but I can actually just add an example so let me try to get to my text editor and then use that to illustrate an example. Um, it's hard for me to see it because it's, the font is too small. Essentially, mouse pad. So. Since I cannot really use the Greek letters here, I just have to use name of the Greek letter. So in order to fire this in order to you know, really make use of these tools, all I have to say is we can make psi the same as one of the variables or one of the constants. It doesn't really matter which one. So let's just say we pick a constant. Okay, so we can make psi equal to false or true. So that means now we can say zero um, or not zero. We can now you know, basically look at this expression, look at this WFF, and say this is true. Search order. Is that okay? <clears throat> and that's all we are doing. Okay, you know, I don't even care whether a particular WFF is true or not. I 
pick it up and I say, hey, yo, WFF, I'm going to make a new WFF out of you. So you, or the negation of you, is going to be put. Okay? Is that okay? All right? So that's a very special rule because it, it does not have any requirements. So the next one has some requirements. So I'm going to put this one on the way over here. So this is the second rule. It starts from here and it ends here. Um, so the way it, what it's trying to say is, if I can find an implication that is true, okay, and I call the left-hand side of the implication phi, I call the right-hand side of the implication phi, and I can also find, okay, whatever this psi turns out to be, if I can find the negation of psi also known to be true at that moment in time, then I can fire this loop. Then I can execute or run this loop. Is that okay? So I'm specifying a pattern that specifies, in this case, two well-formed formulae. Okay, they both have to be true. The first one has to be an implication. The second one has to be the negation of the right-hand side. Of the, of the implication. Is that okay? Okay. If I can find those two well-formed formulae, then I can create, I can then circle, or you know, say this one is also true, the negation of the first part of the implication has to be false. Is that okay? So this is not about creating more uh, well-formed formulae. It is about, if I know these two are true, then I know this one is Okay. So we are basically, you know, if you remember the analogy from last time, we're basically circling more and more well for the form. Um, the next one is also kind of, this one is, um, this is how De Morgan's Law, or at least one of the De Morgan's Law, shows up as a transformation. If I can find a negation of a disjunction, and it has a left-hand side and a right-hand side of the disjunction, then I can go ahead and say the conjunction of the negation of the left-hand side and the, and the other side of the conjunction is the negation of the right-hand side. This has to be true. Now, this is De Morgan's Law. Okay? The way we proved De Morgan's Law in this class was the use of a truth table. I believe we have done that already. But in this case, this is all syntactical. Okay? In other words, I'm looking for a specific pattern and say, if I can find this pattern, then I can mark this pattern as true. If, if I can find something that fits this pattern that is true, and it is true, then I can also mark something of this particular pattern to be true. Is that okay? Does everybody understand what I just said? So I, I, you know, when we get to the examples, you know, we'll we'll find out you know, what I mean by that. Um, the next one here is um, if I find a conjunction that is true, so a, any conjunction has two sides. So I call the left hand side phi. I call the right hand side psi. In other words, these are placeholders, okay? Because I can find a conjunction that is true, but then how do I refer to the left hand side and the right hand side? Um, you use the schemata. So with three schemata symbols, that means I am putting a fairly you know, uh, severe limitation. So I cannot really do something that's really, really you know, difficult to do because I can really only specify up to three parts. Okay. So in this case, you know, if I can find a conjunction that is known to be true and it has a left-hand side and a right-hand side, then I can infer that the left-hand side by itself has to be sense, right? You know, based on what we understand about conjunction, that kind of makes sense. And then the other one is, uh, this is about commutation or the commutative property of conjunction. If I can find a conjunction where phi is the left-hand side and psi is the right-hand side, then I can also infer that the conjunction that has psi as the left-hand side and phi as the right-hand side should also be true. Is that okay? Because I can flip the, the two sides here with conjunction and disjunction, and it doesn't really change the meaning of the expression. So this is a very small subset 
of transformation rules that represent you know, the entire Boolean algebra. Okay, but it's, it's just a really small subset because I just need this many in order to illustrate what I need to illustrate. Okay, so now we go to actually utilize these rules. So um, this is iota, which means if you think about the entire space, every no, every um, well-formed morphism based on you know, the alpha that we have here and also based on omega that we have here, these are the ones that we initially circle and say, okay, these are true, but don't ask me why they're true. I must just hope that you give us the answer. Okay? So now we start with that, and then we say, what if I make phi, you know, S or T, and we make phi equal to Q? In other words, I'm picking a well-formed formula that is not even appearing in iota, which is S or T, and the other one is Q, which is also not, you know, appearing in iota by itself. But that's okay, because, you know, the rule that I want to match is not using, you know, phi or phi S to detect this um, well-formed formulae. I'm using it to, to match this. In other words, can I find, of all these well-formed formulae things, can I find one where it is an implication, the left-hand side is S or T, and the right-hand side is just Q? Oh yeah, you can find it right here. Okay, and then, but now that I have found, you know, I have already um, bound psi to Q, then the next question is, can I also find not Q as one of the well-formed formulae that is marked to be true? The answer is, yeah, it is also here, because they're both in iota. Is that okay? Because, you know, this is the part where we do the pattern matching. Once we satisfy the, uh, the pattern matching part of a rule, then we can go like, okay, now we can actually quote unquote run or fire or execute the rule. And now we can say, okay, whatever this you know, phi was, okay, the negation of that should, can now be marked as true. So in this case, because your know, phi is S or T, so that means I can now label or mark or circle the negation of S or T to be true. So these three lines is basically you know, executing the second rule of the set. I'm gonna pause and see if there are any questions about what I just did. No questions, or you do have questions. I can give you another representation, you know, but I don't have it already captured in my notes, so this part is going to be you know, just on the whiteboard. This is specified as pattern. So I'm really just looking for an implication that is known to be true. I have the left hand side and the right hand side. Do I have any restrictions about what's on the left hand side or the right hand side? Not for the time being. But I need the schematics to be perfectly precise so I can later on use them. Is that okay? So the other pattern that, that I'm matching is the negation of psi. So so I'm looking for something that has a negation of psi. So I'm looking for something that has a negation, but this psi has to be set the same as the psi that we did the set. Okay? So if I can find both of these well formed formulae of the well formed formulae of all the of the well formed formulae that are known to be true, then I can now mark the next one to be true as well. So I'm going to create another negation here, but instead of using psi, I'm going to like, okay, according to the rule, whatever the left-hand side of the implication is, which 
my component behind in this case, so I'm comprising. So now I'm basically saying look for this, look for this, and both of values, then we should now label this thing as a key. Which symbol again? Oh, the symbol of um, star. Okay. This is negation. No, no, I meant the right. This thing? Yeah. Oh, it's just me trying to erase the thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> because originally, at first, I put the sign right over here, which is not with the representation of a tree, because I want to give you a tree view of it, right? Okay. But basically, it's pattern matching. It's basically, okay, I need this parent, and I need this parent, but I need two other things. If I can find both of these, then I can search for this thing as a key. Okay. Yeah. 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 Of the set of well formed form of keys that are searched with them. Okay, so that's our key. <coughs> because you know, the, the thing is, you know, there are, if you look at all the well formed form names in the type space, it is not a procedure to mark you know, things as true. Uh, basically, there are things we are basically discovering which one should be true. Is that okay? So we can we can describe a set of all the well-formed formulae that are true because of iota, but we what we are, what I'm doing here is a very procedural example of how to do this. Is that okay? Right. So can I lower the screen again? Okay, the the diagram is relatively simple. It is just here to illustrate what I mean by pattern matching. All right, so but that's just the first step. Okay, you know, we've got a few more examples coming, so hopefully th those would also help to illustrate what it means by matching the pattern. So the second step is here. I make psi s, I make psi t, but I, what I'm really trying to match is the negation of a disjunction, where the left hand side of the disjunction is the phi, and the right hand side of the disjunction is in other words, I'm looking for, hey, is the negation of S or T known to be true? Now, not from IOTA, it's not, but from the previous step, we got it, okay? Because the result of the previous step is to say S or T or the negation of S or T is now labeled. Or we discover that the negation of S or T is true. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so because of that, we can now you know, also quote unquote fire this particular rule. So now we discover that the negation of psi, that's what we mean by phi, which is s, and the negation of psi, which is t, this conjunction also has to be true. Why? Because you know, that's basically what the rule specifies. So when we circle the well-formed formulae in this space, now we circle conjunction where the left hand side is not s and then the right hand side is not t. Are we doing okay so far? So the pattern matching part is looking for you know, uh, potentially a bunch of you know, expressions that meet a certain requirement. If all the requirements are met, then we utilize the schemata wrapping in on the left on the left hand side of the input symbol to to label so that we know what expression to label on the right hand side. Is that doing okay so far? Yep. Say again? Yes. But that's because what that's what the rule specifies. That's also the Morgan's law, which we briefly talked about earlier. 
So this is all syntactic, okay? And let me emphasize one more time. This is all syntactic. In other words, if you create a rule that does not make sense, it doesn't match any one of the Boolean algebra axioms, you still have a system. It's just that the result of the system is meaningless. Okay, so we'll talk about you know what is completeness and also what is soundness in just a minute. All right, well, since we are uh, close to being done, we'll, we'll go ahead and look at the next one. So this time I'm looking for a particular expression or phi is not s and not t. Okay, um, and we found it. Okay, because you know in this case uh, we just made it in the previous step. Okay, so we just labeled it in the previous step. So we found this particular pattern. We have found the pattern of a conjunction where it has a left hand side and a right hand side. Not surprisingly, but what we are doing is we are now labeling um, the um, the a conjunction, but with the left hand side and the right hand side exchange. Is you know, we are labeling the other one. Yep. Are you referring to this part? A mistake here. Phi is not S and Phi is not T. Yep, I did, I did make a mistake. When I tried to specify you know, how we map the rule, you know, I made a mistake. Good. All right. Um, do you guys want me to fix it first? I would, I would just fix it first. So let me see if I can. Oh, I got this in already, so I can actually just do this in a different tab. A lot of scrolling. Yep, GitHub is cool. Since I have to wait a little bit before I make, okay. this is really kind of cool about this GitHub is you can actually post, uh, you have you have GitHub to post your web pages basically for free. Okay, I never pay for my GitHub, you know, subscription. <coughs> so the idea is to use your GitHub.io or GitHub.com in order to publish the content. Um, as, as far as I know. Um, well, it depends on what you call static. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the no, I fixed it correctly. So anyway, it is fixed now. Um, but what was the question again about GitHub? Oh, static content, that's right. So it's not, it depends on what you call static. If you want to have a server-side script to require a database and stuff like that, then yes, you know, from that perspective, it is static. On the other hand, if you want your finished HTML page to contain like a bazillion JavaScript stuff to do all kinds of cool stuff, it is not. So it does allow you to use JavaScript you know, on the client side to do whatever you need. So from that perspective, it's not an entirely static because you can still specify client side activity with JavaScript. You know, you can combine that with um, other things you can do with, uh, say, Google Docs. You know, you can, you can still implement like a full API, you know, coding on the client side. So you can still make it kind of dynamic. All right. So next. Okay. So th I, I just fixed the, the problem. So what I meant to say is phi is not s, phi is not t. I'm looking for a conjunction of those two. 
and I found it because I just created it previously. Is that okay? So that means I can now you know, execute the rule. Now this rule is only taking care of one side because you know um, each transformation can only label one raw form formulae, well form formula as true. So in this case, I'm only labeling the one on the left hand side of the conjunction to be true. But then since I used commutative earlier, so now I can use the other one. You know, same mistake. You know, you know you want me to fix that. Apologize that I have to keep fixing these things because I just made this today. This one is For commutative, and then this is for extracting one side of the conjunction. This is for extracting the other side of the conjunction. Wait for 45 seconds or so. But the bottom line is, after we you know, go through all of these transformations, um, at the very end. We labeled not s to be true. We also labeled not t to be true, or I should say, we discover that not s is true, not t is also true. So that means s itself is false, t is also false. Is that okay? So I did not quite present this you know, as a theorem to be true in some sense, but you can kind of imagine that you know, the theorem is s is false. Okay. And these are the steps to prove that S is false or not S is true. Let me refresh. It should be updated now. Yep. Okay. So we got everything updated. This is all good. All right. So I hope this helps to illustrate what I mean by pattern You know, as the first step of you know, running a rule, once you know, we establish the pattern is matched, then we execute a rule and then we label we discover another well-formed formula to be true. Is that okay? So I'm going to pause a little bit and just kind of digress. Do you think you can write a program to do this? Sorry? But can you? <laughs> It'll take you some time. Yep. So to write this program, okay, there are a few things that are needed. Um, first of all, you know, if you are using index notation and you're representing the expressions um, just using a string, then you need to be able to parse. So parsing a string is not as easy as it seems, especially when it is an index notation. So index note. How many people know what I'm talking about? Index notation. So index notation is what we are used to. So let me just give you a typical index notation you know, uh, formula. This one is just in normal algebra. So we can have a plus b, the whole thing, times b. Let me take this entire thing and divide it by b. Oh, make it a little more complex. Make it uh, divided by b plus, okay. So this is an infix notation, and I think all of you can look at this expression and know exactly what it looks like, right? You know, what to perform, what to do in this case. Unfortunately, what seems to be easy for us to understand because it's using index notation is actually difficult to parse. In other words, it's difficult to, uh, to use an algorithm 
to go through the characters one by one to reconstruct the tree that is representing the structure of this thing. So what do you mean? What do I mean by the tree of this whole thing? I mean like this. Okay, I can actually use text to represent the entire tree. The last operation, which is the root, is a division. What are we dividing? Well, we are dividing. You know, the the top, which has a uh, multiplication. That's the last operation of multiplication. The multiplication, the first thing, the second thing. Okay, the first thing we are multiplying is the sum of a and b. So now we have a, b, and then the second thing we are multiplying is c, and then the on the other side of the division we have a sum between c and d. So this is kind of a tree structure if you look at it sideways and kind of line up things in a slightly different way. So to turn it from a string, which is a linear array of characters, into its structural representation, is not easy, because infix notation requires nesting or the understanding of nesting. So that means the parser um, is not going to be very easy to write. There are two approaches. One is called an LL parser. The other one is called an LR parser. Okay. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of you know how to write a parser or what you know what is the distinction between LL parsing and LR parsing. If you're interested, go look for the Dragon Book. Yes, you heard me right, the Dragon Book. <laughs> dragon Book. So the Dragon Book is called the Dragon Book because it talks about compiler techniques and whatnot, but there's a dragon on the cover. So it is you know, affectionately called the Dragon Book. Okay. If this kind of topic is interesting to you, by the time you transfer to a four-year university, you probably want to see if you can take a class like compiler design or compiler slash interpreter design, you know, something along that line. But to un to really um, understand your know, parsing and whatnot, the other class that you probably will have to take anyway is called computational theory, or you know, some people call it the uh, the theory of automata or automata theory. So on, so that's going to be kind of more like a math class. Okay, it, it makes this class look like a baby class, like a baby baby class. Okay, but they talk about you know the theory that Turing, Alan Turing, came up with, and um, it looked at it looks at you know compute computation in a whole different way. So those are the other classes that you might be interested in as upper division classes after this class, if this sort of thing. So getting back to what I was talking about earlier, the infix notation is actually difficult to parse. This is also why your earlier HP calculators, yes, HP was once the same as TI today. They made the de facto standard for calculators. Is that okay? Okay, because you know, most of you do not know that HP made calculators, but they did. They were very successful at you know, making calculators. But those calculators did not have a lot of resources to deal with open parentheses, closed parentheses, operator priority, that sort of thing. So what they did instead is to say, instead of making the calculator more expensive, let's push that responsibility to the end user. So they simply do not did not support parentheses or infix notation. So you go like, so in that case, how do they deal with an expression like this? They use postfix notation. So postfix notation is basically specifying the values that you want to operate on first. Then you specify what to do with it. Okay. So in modern terms, it's kind of like Yoda talk. It's the way Yoda talks relative to normal English. Is that okay? All right. So this particular expression becomes a b plus b times B e plus slash. What does it mean? Okay, it means push A on the stack, push B on the stack, do an addition of the previous two items that are pushed, and then push back, pop these two items, perform the addition, and then push back this up. Okay. Then you push C. Now we have two things on the stack. Pop those things on the stack. 
do a multiplication to push the product back on the stack. So now we have one thing on the stack, then we push D, and then we push E on the stack. So now we have three things on the stack. Then we perform an addition by popping the last two items that we push on the stack. Perform the addition, push the sum on the stack. So now we have this product and this sum on the stack, and then the final operation is the flag, is to pop two items from the stack, divide the second item, divide the first item by the second item. So we push E and then so back on the stack. Okay. So from the from our perspective, this is the first time we see post switch notation. So like I have no idea what this is saying. Okay. And from the perspective of the program that needs to interpret this, it's easy. So there, there are no parentheses, you don't have to understand. There's no need to specify operator priority at all. So in many, many ways, postfix notation is easier than infix notation, simply because you know, we just bypassed a lot of problems that we created for ourselves <coughs> when we chose to use infix notation. You are having a question of, so why did we learn infix notation to begin with? That's purely historical. That is purely historical and traditional. Okay. If we introduce infix notation in elementary school, those kids will never have a problem understanding postfix notation. So it really is just you know how we were taught when we were in uh, elementary school. Kind of like you know if we were taught binary number from elementary school, we won't have a problem with you know addition, subtraction, multiplication. When we look at binary numbers, kind of strangely, because we are not kids. Okay. So the question, so getting back, so I'm popping things from my stack. I'm backtracking. So backtracking back to why we talked about this at all was: Can you write a program to use this kind of infix you know, to execute you know, to recognize things and execute the things? So the answer is. If everything is already given to you as a tree, okay, since all of you are either taking 430 or have taken 430, so that means if I give you the expressions as a tree, then it is relatively easy for you to match the root. Is that okay? Because if you don't have to do any parsing, then you just have to define, you know, how do we call two trees to be exactly the same? Have you guys talked about trees yet in uh, 430? Okay, then you have heard the answer. <laughs> I will not make you write a program to mechanically perform all of these operations. But so it suffices to say that it is not difficult. Okay, you know, once you understand parsing, once you understand data structure, how to compare the equivalency of two trees and so on and so forth, this is like, oh, this is just a gap. So now the question is, what is the problem of this approach? Okay, the, this whole thing, okay, let me hide the bug pack here. So this entire thing is basically the formalization of how we reason, okay, how we apply logic. If you have taken philosophy class called critical thinking, then this is basically just going to like, oh, so instead of us doing it, this is how we can turn this into a mechanical exercise. But the problem still remains. Okay, there's one big problem. The space is infinitely large. In other words, if you think about all the well-formed formulae that are possible, just because we have you know, two constants, five variables, and four operators, okay, the, that space is infinitely large. Just because of the first rule by itself, I can create as I can already mark. Um, okay, I take it back. Just because of one um, operator that takes two operands, I can already create an infinite number of well-formed formulae. Okay. Now that we have three operators that take two different that takes two operands, um, the variety is infinitely large. So, then what is the problem? Well, if I give you a particular well-formed formula and I ask 
if I tell you everything in iota is true to begin with, what about this expression? Is it true or not? When are you going to stop? You keep applying these rules, okay, as much as you can, and you're still not marking the expression that I give you, and I ask you, is this true or not? And you're still not labeling it as true. When do you stop? The answer is kind of hard to say. <laughs> okay, think of this as the proverbial you know, needle in a haystack. Okay, so finding a needle in a haystack is you know basically saying you know it's going to be it's going to take a long time to find it. Okay, but when people say the problem that you gave me is like finding a needle in a haystack, it is imp implied. Okay, I cannot say it's explicit, but it's implied that. The haystack is finite, and the needle is in fact in the haystack. Is that okay? So, if you already know the haystack is only this big, okay, it can be gigantic, okay, it can be the size of this building, but the needle is in the haystack. It is a matter of time before you find that needle. With all the computational resources that we have these days, it's like, yeah, we just throw more processing resources at it, yeah, we'll be done. You can take it. Not a problem. Well, it is a problem, but we'll just say that it's not a problem because at least we know the task at hand. Now that we have a well-formed formula space that is infinitely large, and I ask you, do you think we can label this thing as true? That means I don't even know whether the needle is in the haystack or not, and the haystack is infinitely large. So when do you stop? When can you conclude? Oh, the needle yet that you want me to find is not even in the haystack. You can say that easily when the haystack itself is finite, because you just search through the entire haystack. It's like tech. Did you just give me a trick question? Because there's no needle in this entire haystack. Okay, I might be you know, tricking you. But if the haystack is infinitely large, how can you distinguish the fact that you have not found the needle? Versus the needle is not even in the haystack to begin with. Do you see the problem? Okay. So what are we going to do? Well, the conventional way of performing logical reasoning mechanically does not have a you know, sure way to, to fix this problem. Okay. So what we're going to do is what I'm going to do is to take this on a you know, in a different approach. So to take this into a different approach, I'm going to bypass your completeness and soundness for now. Okay. Instead, I'll talk about resolution time. So resolution is um, basically the use of this particular implication, which is always true. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at the expression first, and then we'll take a look, take a quick look at the proof of it. So I claim that this implication is always true. So there are a few ways to prove this. One way is to use lean, uh, Boolean algebra, which is what I did here. What is the other way to prove something is always true? When we have, what, three variables? The truth table, exactly. So if you want to, okay, which I highly encourage, is to make a truth table to show that this implication is always true. There's an implicit pair of parentheses from here in other words, your conjunction has a higher operator priority compared to implication. Okay, so let's see how many independent variables do we have here. Phi is one, phi is one, and then row is one. There are only three independent variables. So how many rows do we have in this truth table if we are to use the truth table approach? Eight, that is correct. Okay, so we have eight rows in this truth table. And all you have to do is to say every single row of this truth table ends up is being true. Then you have the laziest, but also the tedious, the most tedious way to prove a theorem in Boolean algebra. Is that okay? Does everybody understand what I just said? Okay. So the other way to prove it is to use Boolean algebra. So I'm going to briefly describe, in this case, you know, what I use in this particular proof. So from here to here, what did I use in order to have the first equality? Okay, I'm going to 
to uh, nuke my uh, my mouse pad. Try my oh, mouse pad on the other side. Do I still have it? Yep, I do. There we go. All right. So what is the first rule that I use? I mean, what did I? How did I turn it from something that has an implication symbol to something that does not have an implication symbol? I'm giving you a test, right? A implies C is the same thing as A. Not A. Okay, no, not A. Or B. That's right. Okay? In other words, I took the entire left-hand side here and negate. And then I turned the operator implication into a only. Might say, but when did we talk about this? Like the first day, at the very beginning of the entire semester. Okay. So this means you know reviewing the all the stuff, you know, kind of like I wouldn't say continuously, okay, but making sure that you really grasp you know all the concepts that we talked about even early on is actually important. Okay, so this is the rule that we use. A implies B is the same thing as not A or B. I distinctly remember this discussion because I gave you the truth table for both expressions. And then we saw that both expressions gave us the same values for all four rows. I am not very good at remembering things, especially things that I said. But even I can remember that. Okay. That means you, know, you might need to kind of take note if you're not remembering that. All right, so what about the second one? This line to this line here, what is changed? Oh, I take the negation of the OR and then turn that into the negation of the left hand side of the OR, of the AND, sorry, this is an AND, and also negate the right hand side of the AND and then change the operator into a OR. I think we also talked about this a little bit. This is De Morgan's law, kind of one part of the law. In other words, what I'm saying here is the rule that I'm using is the negation of A and B is the same as the negation of A by itself <coughs> or the negation of B. That's De Morgan's law, or one of the De Morgan's laws. All right, what about the third one, okay, from here to here? I apply De Morgan's law again, okay? So I look at this negation of this or, and then I say, okay, it's the same thing as negating the left-hand side of the OR, negating the right-hand side of the OR, but change the operator of OR into the OR. So that is also De Morgan's Law. This is the other half of De Morgan's Law. The negation of A or B is the same thing as the negation of A and the negation of B. Good so far? All right. So if these Boolean algebra rules are new to you, you might want to consider writing it down, okay? Because the more you practice, the more you kind of exercise, okay, I'm writing this down, and this is the structure of the of these you know, transformation, the more you can remember these rules for later on, okay? I can guarantee you that you're going to need to know how to do this in algebra. All right, so that's that. And what about the next line? The next line has you know, this phi becoming phi and true, and it has this rho becoming rho and true. So what rule did I use in this case? The identity of conjunction. Okay? In other words, um, A is the same thing as A and true. Is that okay? So if you look at any one of these like it does not seem to make sense, how can you get to the satisfaction of this is the same thing as this? Which is very good, okay? And <coughs> we can do a little counter of how many times I'm going to say this is the same thing as this. It, it really is that useful, 
Okay, it's one of those things where you can only do it in Boolean algebra. You cannot do it in any other kind of algebra. Ever. All right. So then, what do I do on the next line, which is, which seems to be going backward because we're making the expression longer and longer. So in this case, I turn this true into psi or not psi. I turn this true into psi or not psi true. Okay. So that is basically just saying, you know, a or not a has to be true. Does that make sense to you? And I cannot remember the remaining of this particular rule. Okay, I'm not, I'm particularly bad at remembering names. Okay. So the next line is the longest line. Okay, this one is saying um, phi and blah blah or blah blah is the same thing as phi or psi or. Okay, I must be reading the wrong line. So this is this expression. This one single expression here turns into this expression here. What does that remind you of in normal algebra? Distribution, exactly. So this indeed is distribution. So if we go to the other slide, we have distribution. And this is one form of distribution because your uh, Boolean algebra can actually distribute the other way as well. So we have A and B or C being the same thing as A or C and B or C. Does that look familiar to you? Well, I mean, not so much the operator themselves, but the structure of the of the thing. Okay. It should, okay, you know, because this is the same thing as A times B plus C. Oh, the other way around. Okay, this one should not look familiar to you. Okay. Actually, okay. Okay, let me give you the other one. This is one distribution, but distribution the other way works too. So they have the exact, I wouldn't say opposite, but they complement the formula. This also works. In normal algebra, this one does, you know, one of them does not work. In other words, if I give you um, A times B plus A plus C, it does not translate to A plus C times B plus C. But in Boolean algebra, the both distribution works. So once again, if you are not convinced that this expression, especially this one, if you're not convinced that this expression is exactly the same as this expression here, use a truth table. No idea how many people would actually go ahead and use truth tables at least on a few of these, okay, especially the ones that are not so obvious. But I'm going to tell you that it is helpful, okay, just to do it on the ones that you think is like, I'm not really sure about this one. Use a truth table, okay, because you can then convince yourself that the rule does make sense in Boolean algebra. All right, so that is that. And then I rearrange things a little bit, okay, so that we how we change from this row to this row over here. So what did I do over here? So you can see that you know I grouped not phi or phi together and then use a conjunction to end it with not phi. I'm basically doing the reverse of distribution. So in normal algebra, what is the name of doing the reverse of distribution? Factoring, that is correct. So I'm doing factoring. So in this case, I am doing factoring because I find not phi and not psi right here. I find phi and not psi over here. So I took this item, put it right next to this item here, and I say, hey, you guys are both ending with not psi. Why don't we just you know, do the not end with no not sign together, and then we are going to make a new expression to uh, end with not sign. So this is distribution, which you know, applied in a backward way. Okay. In other words, 
what we are really looking at is the reverse of believe in this case, let me see, the last one, no, it is the reverse of this one. It's the reverse of this one, sorry, take that. It's the reverse of this one, we found this on one side, we're going to be turning into, we found something that looks like a right hand side, and then we're going to be turning into Basically, just that. What do we do? Okay, so far. Oh. <clears throat> and then, what do we do? I do. And then I recognize that not phi or phi is just true. I also recognize that rho or not rho is also just true. So I simplify the notes into true and true over here. It is also the reverse of a rule that we have already seen. And that would be this way. Okay, so we're just applying this rule, but kind of op in the opposite direction compared to what we did earlier. And then what do we do? We look at this one, which is true, and something. Ah, uh, this is not needed, okay? Because true is the identity with respect to conjunction. So that means true and whatever is just the whatever. Why you know, waste your extra space to say true? So that is the reverse of this particular rule. So after that, we cleaned up a few things. We go like, okay, so what else can we do? Well, we look at these two and go like, let's apply that rule again, okay? Because now we have not phi or phi, which means this thing becomes a true, so we have a true here. Then we say, oh, okay, forget about the whole thing because true or whatever is just true. So that means you know, the last rule is this one here. I have not mentioned it. So it basically says you know, A or true is just true. So these are the specific rules that are used in the derivation of those equations. Are we okay so far? Does each rule make sense to you? Some of these may make sense, you know, kind of just intuitively. The other ones go like, eh, I'm not sure about that one. Great, okay? If you find one, then you go like, I'm not sure about this one. Running through the truth table. Okay. So I'm going to mention a few more, okay? You know, because, you know, once we have the identity of conjunction, we can also mention the identity of disjunction. If anything or false is just the original anything, a and false is always false. So those are the counterparts of the ones that we have to say All right. Any questions about the derivation itself? In the test, you will be applying Boolean algebra, but for different purposes. So I just want to take, take a quick poll. How many people feel comfortable with algebra? Just normal algebra, not Boolean algebra. Just normal algebra. Okay, cool. This is not much more complicated. It just has certain things that is like, eh, that looks awkward. Well, but the way you apply it, it still depends. All right. So now that we have gone through the proof, Let's go back to the statement that we were proving to begin with. In other words, this implication is always true regardless of the values of phi, psi, and rho. So you go like, what is the big deal of this particular, what is the big deal of this particular implication? The big deal about this implication is if you can find this pattern, it means this, if this is true, if the left-hand side is true, then the right-hand side is always true, too, because this implication is guaranteed true. So what is the what is the whole point? Look at the number of variables on the left-hand side of the implication and look at the number of variables on the right-hand side of the implication. What do you notice? How 
how many variables do we have on the left hand side of the indicator? You know, three. What about the number of um, variables on the right hand side? Two. Huh. Okay. Kind of a strange thing, right? So this side here, okay, it doesn't have to be a single variable. It can be an entire gigantic expression. As long as one side is boring with that entire gigantic expression, and the other one is boring with the negation of the same expression, I can still perform the simplification. Okay? Which is kind of cool, but what does that have anything to do with what we are trying to, you know, what, what does it have to do with propositional logic? Okay, that's the question. If you're having that question, that's perfectly normal. Okay? We need two more ingredients. And then we then we have everything that we need in order to make this operation. Okay. So the second thing we also need, okay, slowing down here to see, is CNF. So CNF is conjunctive normal form. Okay, so let me not even let me see when I first refer to the host. So we are going to refine the qualification of a WFF, or well-formed formula. So we got some new rules here. So the new rule is, in omega-1, we are keeping negation. So we are still keeping negation as an operator. And then we are ditching all the other operators. We are only, we are only keeping OR as a operator that requires two operators. You guys, you guys go like, what about AND? Well, AND is actually implicit. Because all the well-formed formulae that are already circled, they are basically part of one gigantic conjunction because they're all true at the same time. Okay, so we have a conjunction kind of implicitly done already. So now we have some new stuff here. Uh, is ADE is you know basically is a disjunction element? It can be a part of a disjunction. Okay. So um, what can be a part of a con of a disjunction? This can be a part of a disjunction. So every element in alpha can be a disjunctive element, can be a disjunction element. Everything that is a negation of an element of alpha can also be a disjunction element. That's basically what this is saying. So let me kind of go through this one more time. For every E in alpha, in other words, E is an element of alpha, it is a disjunctive element. So P is a disjunctive element, U is a disjunctive element, and so on. But so are the negations of those variables. So this is basically saying if P is an element of A, then the negation of that is also a disjunctive element. So that means not P is a disjunctive element, not Q is a disjunctive element, 0 is a disjunctive element, 1 is a disjunctive element, and so on. Is that okay? What about this statement here? What is it saying? Look at all those you know, symbols. Well, we read it step by step. For every i in 1 to n, okay, so I'm starting to count this from 1, <coughs> this is going to be true based on the equation we are defining, you know, kind of a well-formed formula. So we are basically saying, let's say we have n disjunctive elements. So phi of i, each one is a disjunctive element, and we have n of those. So basically I'm just saying, okay, give me a bunch of disjunctive elements. Is that okay? If that is the case, okay, if I have these disjunctive elements, then if I do a or of all of those disjunctive elements, then we have a well-formed form. thinking, so perhaps we have the most obscure way of describing something, you have thought this one out from the perspective of a lower division college. Okay, so a division a college that can only teach lower division classes. But this language is um, foreign to us only because this may be the first class 
that you encounter these particular symbols and these expressions. But I can assure you, reassure you, that in the upper division classes that you'll be taking at a four-year university, these things will come back. Okay, so that means that if you practice more now, it will just make it a little bit easier later on. All right. So let's give us some examples. Okay, so let's go to the notepad, and we are going to say, okay, just for the sake of this argument, let's just say P Q R. Okay, so alpha has P Q and R as lowercase here. And I will use the um, C++ notation. Yeah, let me throw in some you know, cards here too. Fine. There we go. So now I'm going to ask you, um, what about this one? Is it, can it be a disjunctive element? Yep, it is the negation of something that is in alpha. Automatically qualifies as a disjunctive element. Uh, what about uh, this one here? problem. So now I'm asking you, what about this expression? Can I call this a well-formed formula? It is a, yep, exactly, because in this case, I'm basically saying there are two, okay, n is two. Um, you have phi one being not in by two being in R, it is also a disjunctive element. Okay? So that implies that the disjunction of all of the, both of these things right here is a well formed formula. But this is the only way you can have a well formed formula. Nothing else is a well formed formula. Is that okay? So even though negation is one of the operators, so let me just go back here say that this is a well-formed, is a well-formed formula. But then if you put a negation on the outside, this is not a well-formed formula. Why is this not a well-formed formula? Well, we'll work from the ground up, okay? So we're going to do this from the bottom up in the fashion. Q is a disjunctive element, not in this case. Dot R, yeah, which is also a disjunctive element. So by itself is well formed. And so the negation of that, did I say anything about the negation of a or is well formed? No. So that means you know the negation of the or is not well formed. Is that okay? Yes or no? Yes? <clears throat> I probably should you can you can negate your I mean inside the parentheses as long as you can write it as blah blah or blah blah or blah blah and each thing in the or is either and al something from alpha or the negation of something from alpha question here so if you want to make something that is not particularly meaningful one or not one or p or not q. No, that's fine. It is well formed. Okay, it is well formed. No, it is not useful because you know, since we start with the true or blah blah blah, the whole thing is kind of useless. But the question is, is it co syntactically correct when we are looking at what is considered to be well formed? This is well formed. Forget about and, okay? Because and is not even an operator that we can use. Neither is implication. Is that okay? So now this looks like really, really restricted, right? You know, we are confining, we are basically confining what we can consider to be well formed to be a gigantic or of either the negation or the non negative version of something from alpha. It's like, how do we express stuff that we used to be able to express? So we'll go ahead and I'm going to finish this as an example. Okay? So let's take a look at the one example that we saw earlier, which was what? S, um, S or T, the whole thing implies, or if 
by an open number. I think this is just by an integer. Q, Q. It was Q. That was it. Okay. So, <coughs> so we will we'll take a look at this expression. It's like I bet you cannot express this expression as a you know, well-formed formula. And the answer is actually yes. Okay. So I'll explain why it is okay. So now we look at this, and you know, remember this thing was in iota, right? So this whole thing is in iota. So now we go like, okay, this is the old way of doing things. How about the new way of doing things? So I'm going to use the abbreviation, you know, which is you know, or plus the plus, implication the zero implication. So this is now um, the negation of S or T, the whole thing, or Q, because of the uh, a implies B is not A or B. And then look at this and go like, mm, De Morgan's law, right? So dot S and dot T. And what looks like multiplication is conjunction. Okay? So now I look at this and go like, eh, let's see. We can now apply um, distribution. So now it becomes not S or Q and not S dot T. So once again, what looks like multiplication is conjunction. What looks like addition is uh, disjunction. Okay, I'm just giving it this way so you don't mind the C notation. Okay, so I stop here. You go like, but tech, this is not even well formed. You have a bunch of conjunction here, and conjunction is not even allowed in the well formed formula. That's okay. All I need to do is now to say, well, we'll just make this which is well-formed as an element in iota, but we are also going to invite its buddy to be in iota too. In other words, what was one single well-formed formula in the previous way of doing things, where we allowed the implication and all kinds of stuff like that, is now becoming two well-formed formulae, but they express exactly the same thing. Are we doing okay so far with that concept? Because everything in IOTA are ended together anyway. So there's an implicit end of all the elements in IOTA. In other words, end is actually allowed. It's just we cannot write it. Is that okay? So the next time we meet on next Monday, which is five days from today, which means you guys probably need a whole bunch of reviewing and studying and whatnot, is we'll talk about how we can transform any well-formed formula in the old way into well-formed formulae in the new way. Okay, so that's going to be the focus of the next class. And then after that, we'll have an assignment so that you guys can go ahead and do this kind of thing. All right. I'll see you. Yep, go ahead. Monday is a holiday again? That is so wrong. Okay, um, so I will see you guys on next Wednesday. That gives you guys two more days to study all this stuff and do all the reviews that kind of leads up to this point. Thank you for, the, uh, for letting me know. I'm the one person in this class who does not keep track of all.